Chairman Brown, Chairman, Lu Chairman Loomis, Ranking Members Maffei and Swalwell, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify on subsidies for wind power. Today's op hearing is a particularly valuable opportunity because it comes in the juncture of two things. The continuing environment of fiscal stress against which these subsidies are being evaluated and the dawn of a new age of energy with clean, affordable, secure, domestically produced gas. GAO's report identifies a number of fragmented, sometimes duplicative programs to assist wind energy, which itself has had over 100 years of existence, 20 years of federal support. And for all of these efforts, wind technology, wind energy remains far from cost competitive with conventional controllable power sources. Unlike dispatchable sources, wind turbines cannot increase production when power demand is high and their intermittency imposes costs on other power producers and customers. These costs include additional transmission, environmental impacts, and distortions of competitive energy markets. My testimony will touch on both the operational problems of wind energy itself and how federal government and support and state requirements such as renewable energy quotas can aggravate these problems. I'll make six basic points. First, there is no amount of federal support that can make the wind blow. In most regions, it's strongest at night when power demand is uh, lowest and weakest during afternoon peaks. Unpredictable winds contribute to operating reliability problems in economic grids because the amount of power produced in an area must equal exactly the amount users wish to consume every second. And except for hydroelectric dams, there is no co uh, low cost way to alleviate the problem. Second, our, in our abilities to forecast wind continue to be fairly weak but improving. System operators and planners cannot count on it as a dependable resource. The grid operator in Texas counts a megawatt of wind generation capacity as equal to only one-twelfth of a megawatt of dependable generation capacity for its system planning purposes. Wind's full costs exceed include those of isolation of wind sources. Of the Texas's planned $8.7 billion in new high voltage lines, fully $5 billion worth will be reaching wind units that produce only 30% of the time. But even if we look only at generation costs, the Energy Information Administration forecasts that in 2018, an advanced gas-fired plant will have a 24% lower cost per megawatt hour than an onshore wind unit. And notice that this is inclusive of the fuel cost. Third, an environmental case for wind may look easy because no fuel is burnt when it's produced. In reality, intermittency raises costs because it forces the use of costly fossil fuel backups whose costs are also associated with pollutants and pollution controls. Where gas-fired backup capacity is limited, as has happened in uh, Colorado and Texas, there are few alternatives to additional operation of coal-fired generators. Fourth, wind's value depends on the values of other energies. Federal programs, like those GAO notes, could impact future technologies. But even if they succeed in advancing wind technologies, the value they might create is already falling. For there's growing agreement that America's energy future is changing for the better as advances in natural gas proliferate, increasing its affordability and our security. Today, the fears of hydrocarbon scarcity that once informed wind energy subsidies are rapidly receding memories. New supply technologies are being matched by advances in consumer responsiveness that better accurately adjust to scarcity. In practice, what wind does is it randomizes and distorts prices in power markets and increases the risks of incorrect and inefficient responses to changing conditions. Fifth, wind power's actual and hidden costs matter for the many American families who have seen several years of hardship. These costs have to turn up sooner or later in their power bills or in their taxes and they are costs with very few benefits. A tax means that consumers must pay to buy something that's of low value and that must harm them. It does create benefits for those whose influence helped it become law. Our case in point now in question is the one-year extension of the production tax credit, which the Joint Committee on Taxation has taxed as a, tw scored as a $12 billion increase in costs. Sixth and finally, wind cannot bring prosperity by bringing green jobs. They have little basis in logic, no visibility in practice. As I showed in earlier testimony, which I've attached to today's, the natural renewable, National Renewable Energy Laboratory's technique for estimating them is devoid of value because its only mathematical possible result, regardless of the numbers that are input, is that wind will create jobs. The real question 
that matters is not green jobs. It is good jobs, and for good jobs, America needs abundant energy. That's what makes us more productive, not expensive energy that we cannot rely on. Thank you.